We hope you enjoy today's message on Acts chapter 2 verse 38 preaching channel. Please like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to help us grow. Amen. Good morning. Uh, I'm glad to see that uh, everybody made it on time today. And, and I hope you got plenty of sleep. Um, I'm going to tell you, you watch. In 17 minutes, we're probably going to see a group come in. <laughs> if it's anything like back home. <laughs> uh, well, I am glad to be here in San Jose this morning. What an honor it is. And uh, I love this church. And uh, I'll, I almost feel like I go here. Because I see stuff on social media and watch the you know videos and, and I, I've always been inspired by this church and um, inspired by Brother Shoemake, the leadership here. And so it is certainly a, a privilege for us to be here. Um, I, uh, I, I want to give honor to uh, Brother Elder Brother Shoemake uh, this morning. I was so glad to see you and Sister Shoemake here this morning. It was a surprise for me. I had the privilege of uh, being in, in a class for a little while with Elder Shoemake, and uh, I, uh, I, I found myself skipping over a lot of the comments, and I would go right to Elder Shoemake, <laughs> because it was always really good. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said that, should have I? Um, but uh, what an honor it is. Brother Shoemake and Sister Shoemake, I uh, give honor to you. You're one of my favorite preachers in top five for sure. And um, so y'all are a blessed people here today. Amen. And glad to have my wife here. If you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 20. Uh, no, yeah, Genesis 29. Um, I, I have twins uh, back in Arkansas. It's a, they're three years old, a boy and a girl. And I have a six-year-old boy Bentley and uh, we're glad they're not here <laughs> but sad about it all at the same time <laughs> I don't know if anybody can relate to that but uh, you have twins you'll relate to it <laughs> Three. but it's uh, so we're, we're glad to have the opportunity to come and, and do this Genesis chapter 29, uh, verse 15. I hope I said everything I'm supposed to say. Genesis 29, in verse 15. And Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught? Tell me, what shall thy wages be? And Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah. And the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed, which uh, I believe it means cow-eyed is the literal translation there. Um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but I can tell you it's not good. And, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And Laban said, it's better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. Somebody's going to have her. It may as well be you, Jacob. He said, abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. And Jacob said unto Laban, Laban, give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go in unto her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him. And he went in unto her. And Laban gave unto his daughter Leah Zilpah, his maid for an handmaid. And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this thou hast done unto me? Did not I serve with thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? I want to preach this morning that Rachel is still available. And I come to tell somebody here today, Rachel is still available. 
I wonder if we could pray together and ask that God would help us, that God would touch us. Jesus, we love you today. We are thankful for your word. We are thankful for this opportunity to come together, Jesus. God, I'm asking that you will anoint me today to preach your word and that you will anoint all of us to hear and to receive it today, God. Lord, let heaven kiss this room today, Jesus. Let your will be done in every life and in every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for standing for so long, and you can be seated this morning. Uh, you, you see at places in the Bible where Jesus, he would break down a story uh, to uh, help his listeners better understand uh, what the meaning of the story was. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I believe that in, in the Bible, every story uh, is, uh, is there for a reason. And it's in there so that we can learn from it and we can apply it to our lives. And uh, this story is uh, one such story that we can certainly apply to our lives. And I, I want to I break down this story to help us uh, uh, apply it to our lives. In, in this story, we have four characters that we want to talk about today. And the first one is Jacob. And Jacob, he represents the struggler, the hill grabber. Um, uh, the very name means struggler and hill grabber. And so, in, in, sh- in short, Jacob represents you and I because all of us are struggling today. Leah represents the ugly and the unwanted things that life uh, brings our way sometimes. It's the, the mundane, the average, the mediocre. Rachel represents the beautiful, the dream, That God has put in your heart. I believe everybody in this house today. God has put a dream in your heart. Of something better. Of doing something for God. A better life than what you're experiencing here today. If you've got a dream inside of you today. I want you to know that God put that there. It was God that put that dream in your heart. Laban represents life. Because sometimes life will hand you things that you did not ask for. Sometimes life will give you ugly, unwanted things that you were not planning on. Sometimes you're, you're working for the beautiful and the dream. But life comes to you and hands you the ugly instead. I want to preach today about life. And I want to preach to real people here in this house. And uh, I'm, I want to be honest with you today. That bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to good churches. Problems come to Holy Ghost filled people. Financial trouble comes to tithe paying people sometimes. We're, we're living in a real world, and we are, we are dealing with life here today. Life can be unfair, and it can be uncruel. And I, I know that I really don't know most of you, but uh, one thing that I do know today is that I'm preaching to real people. And, and, and there are people in this room today, you are listening to me. And you know what it's like to struggle. I know I'm preaching to people here today. You know what it's like to lay your head on your pillow at night and worry about tomorrow and worry about the future. There are people here today, as a matter of fact, already, I I met them before this service. You know what it feels like for life to not go the way you plan. And I've already seen people here today, Brother Shoemaker, where I can tell you that there is light. They didn't plan for those things to happen. 
Amen. You, there, there's people here this morning. You have stayed up late at night weeping and sobbing over life's problems and circumstances. Or some of you know what it's like to get up early and pace the floors because of life and because of problems and because of setbacks and circumstances. Amen. I, I used to think, Brother Shoemaker, that there were people that were invincible, that there were people who were so strong emotionally that nothing ever got to them, that nothing ever got them down. I really did. I, I looked at men. I looked at great men that I admired and respected in my world. And uh, I, if you would have told me that those men knew what it was like to feel insecure, to feel like uh, the world was caving in, to feel hopeless, I, I would have hardly, uh, not even hardly been able to believe you. But I have since lived long enough now, and I have pastored long enough now to see the strongest men that I have ever known in my life. I mean, uh, the, and even the strongest man that I've ever known, I've lived long enough to, to, to be there on the worst day of his life and watch the door close in his office and him break down and sob and weep like a baby because life had dealt an unfair, uh, an unplanned on circumstance and a problem. I'm here to tell you that life can knock you flat off of your feet. Life can knock you on your back and, ma and make you feel like you will never be able to get up again. Like you'll never be able to recover that. Amen. But I've come here to preach the word of the Lord to somebody here today and tell you, amen, whatever it is that life has dealt to you, you are more than an overcomer. You can overcome it. I've come to preach to First Church in San Jose. Amen. Somebody's going to rise up in this house today. You, I, I am such a believer in the spoken word of God that I believe the anointing of the Holy Ghost can get on me on this Sunday morning and you can hear the word of the Lord and it will breathe life into your soul and you can leave this house and never be the same again. I believe that there are moments that can forever change your destiny. And today is one of those mornings. I grew up very poor. And I grew up in poverty. And I, uh, I know what it's like to go weeks without electricity and running water. I grew up in West Virginia. I can remember heating up pans of snow on the wood stove, pouring it into a bathtub to bathe. There are many days where peanut butter and bread was our only option for food. I, uh, I shared a room with three of my brothers it was an eight feet by ten feet room in, in the attic of an old schoolhouse where we grew up our entire lives. I, I was at least eight years old before we ever even had a front doorknob at our house. There would just be a, a hole in the door. And at night, we would stuff a rag in that hole. And uh, we would take a board and wedge it between the staircase and the door to keep the door closed. Um, I, I, I know what it's like to go to church and be humiliated because my clothes were hand-me-downs and ill-fitting. I can remember distinctly going to church and my, my shoes would have holes in them. And would be four sizes too big. And I can remember feeling like uh, we, were, we were the laughing stock of the church. We would show up. Uh, I'm from a family of eight. And uh, a lot of the times there would be at least six of us uh, in, in a station wagon. We'd show up to church. And uh, my dad was a, a janitor. And the, the back cargo space would be... Uh, full of uh, mop buckets and cleaning buckets and dust mops and, and cleaning supplies. 
And then me and my brother would get in that cargo space. And that's where we would ride with all of that. I remember the hatchback opening at church time. And us crawling out of the back, crawling out of the mop buckets and uh, going to church. And I uh, honestly, I, looking back on it, I really didn't even realize uh, that that was uh, completely unusual. I thought that this is just kind of how everybody had to live. And you don't really think much about it when you're in that situation. And I, I can remember... Uh, two times in my life that I ever saw my dad uh, break down and cry. My dad was a, a, a pretty um, a serious person, I guess you could say, uh, unemotional person. And uh, in, in, in only two times do I remember him crying. The first time that I ever watched him cry, it was uh, on a Tuesday night and. uh in a church service that we were having in, a, in the office, in an office room of a low-income apartment complex that we rented for $12 a night to have service. And we rented it because there was a little piano there already. And we, we would gather in there with a little handful of people. And uh, there, there'd be just, uh, you know, maybe 10 people there. And uh, I can remember distinctly, uh, on this Tuesday night, uh, that so- something happened in that little room, and and uh, in a rare occurrence, the Holy Ghost showed up into that room, and I uh, I, I remember watching my father break down and begin to cry and weep in that room, and he got up and he started talking about a dream that God had put in his heart. Man, God uh, showing him some things that uh, he, he'd like to, to do and, and accomplish in his life and in his ministry. And it, it left an indelible mark on my mind because I had never seen him cry like this before. And so I never forgot what it looked like to see a, a dream try to, try to peek up its head and, uh, and, and reveal itself and express itself in that service that night. Amen. And so uh, I, uh, I, but I'm, I'm telling you that uh, through, throughout the years uh, following, I, I watched life happen. And I watched circumstances come. And very, very quickly, it, it knocked that dream back down before it could uh, even think about coming to fruition, and, uh, and, and somehow uh, it, it just got to the place where uh, it seemed like uh, the, the reality uh, was is that he, he began to believe that th- th- there's just some things you got to settle for, and there's just some things that, uh, that, that happen in life, and that's just the way it is, and there's really not, not much you can do about it sometime, and I watched life uh, stomp out the dream. And I watched life uh, make, make sure that he knew good and well uh, that it, it, he was going to stay th- the way he was. And our family was going to stay the way it was. And I began to believe as a young boy that sometimes life just happens to people. And there's some situation where you just have to stay in those circumstances and those events. Uh, I, I, and, 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 and a big moment in my life happened when I was about 12 years old. Uh, we, we, every year, we would load up in the station wagon, no air conditioner, and the, and the windows all down. And we would take the journey from West Virginia all the way to Little Rock, Arkansas. And it was uh, on a, a summer, about age 12, a summer day, where we uh, rolled into Little Rock, Arkansas, and I remember on that, that first day that we were there that summer that my father and I, we went to the church in Little Rock. And uh, we went there in the afternoon to pray in the sanctuary. And I, uh, I, I had gotten the Holy Ghost when I was eight years old. And so I already had had the Holy Ghost. And I, I, as a 12-year-old boy, I was there praying on, on that summer afternoon and I, I can remember in relation to this building, I, I would have been praying, 
right over here on this side of the, the platform where the stairs came out. And I got onto the floor and I, I began to pray. And that afternoon, Brother Holmes, my pastor, he was also in there praying. And he was up against the, the front pew. He was sitting on the floor cross legged and his back was lean, leaning against the, the front pew. And I, I began to pray. And something came over me that day. And I began to feel something. And I began to experience something that I had never experienced before in all of my life. And I can distinctly remember Brother Holmes uh, uh, behind me. And I could hear uh, him praying. And, And he could tell that I was getting a hold of something in the Holy Ghost as I was praying that day. And I can remember him saying, that's the way to pray, Brother Joseph. And he would say, that's the way to pray. Um, and when he would say that, man, it would, it would, it would encourage me. And I, and I would go a little deeper in, in what I was feeling. And then he, I would hear him say it again. He would say, that's the way to pray, Brother Joseph. And, and, I, uh, and I was praying, and my goodness, something uh, uh, came all over me. And I, I reached a place that I had never reached before in praying. And uh, if, you'll, if you'll allow me to preach it like this this morning, as I was praying, I, uh, I, for the first time in my life, I, I began to, to catch a glimpse of Rachel. And as the, the fog uh, began to, to roll away, and, and, and the, somewhere like a little sun began to glisten. It was like it was, like it was in the morning the sun was beginning to rise as a 12-year-old boy and was beginning to shine light on things that I had never seen before. And for the first time in my life, I saw the beautiful Rachel. And I saw the beautiful dream. And there is, there's something about seeing Rachel that makes you realize uh, if you're living with Leah. And it was on that day I realized uh, that my whole life uh, I have actually been living uh, with Leah. But there was a great God in heaven uh, that was opening up something to me uh, and giving me a glimpse uh, that said there's something more than this. Uh, You don't got to live with Leah. And I am here to tell First Church in San Jose uh, there's been a lot of water gone under the bridge uh, since I was 12 years old. Uh, But there is one thing that is still the same this morning. uh, And that is to this day uh, on this Sunday morning uh, I have never uh, been happy uh, with Leah. And there's something pulsating in the core of my soul that says I will not settle for Leah. I will not settle for the ugly. I will not settle for average, for mediocre. Amen. There's a Rachel that's available. There's something in me that says give me Rachel. Give me the beautiful. Give me the dream. I come to tell somebody here today I know life has given you Leah, but Rachel is still available. After seven long years of working for Rachel, Jacob woke up and discovered that Laban had unexpectedly given him Leah. What a setback. Seven years down the drain. Working for seven years and you're excited about the, your dream coming to fruition. And then the day comes and instead of the dream, you're given the ugly. What, what an experience that must have been. And Jacob, he had a decision to make when that happened. He had a decision to make, what am I going to do with Leah? What, I'm gonna, what am I going to do about what I've been handed and what has happened? Well, I'm glad to tell you here today 
that I love the attitude of Jacob. I love the spirit of Jacob. And I, I want to be like Jacob in these circumstances. Because Jacob, you got to understand something about Jacob. He was born at the wrong time. But he still, he fought for the blessing. He didn't deserve the birthright. He didn't deserve to be blessed because he was born at the wrong time. But he fought for it anyhow. Jacob was handed the wrong name. He was given a name where every time he had to introduce himself, he had to introduce himself as a, as a deceiver, as a manipulator. I mean, imagine trying to introduce yourself to the, the girl at, at school that you had a crush on, and you had to tell her, I'm a I'm manipulator, and you had to describe yourself who you were. He, would, he did, he did he had, what I'm telling you is, he, had the, he even had the wrong last name. Amen. So if you could say it like that. And, but one day, uh, he got in a prayer meeting, uh, and he said, you know what? I, I'm not going to live the rest of my life with this name uh, and with this stigma attached to me. Uh, and we watched Jacob fight his way through it, uh, and God gave him a new name. We watched Jacob fight through being born in the wrong place, uh, and, 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 and God gave him the blessing anyhow. We watched Jacob when Laban reduced his pay ten times. Uh, ten times, uh, Jacob, he worked around and he found a way to overcome his pay reduction. Uh, amen. And so there, there should be no surprise to us uh, that when he was handed Leah, something rose up inside of Jacob. Uh, that spirit of the fighter, the spirit of the hill guy, and he rolled up his sleeves and he said I know that I have just wasted seven years of my life and I've been handed the ugly but let me tell you what Jacob did he wasn't lazy he didn't sit down and give up but he rolled up his sleeves and he said if I have to work for another seven years then bless God I'm going to work another seven years and I will well, I rate y'all. I give me to tell somebody, if it takes you seven years, then get Rachel. If it takes you seven years, roll up your sleeves and say, when the seven years are over, I will have the dream. Don't settle for Leah. You know what, you know, you know what Jacob could have done? He could have, he could have settled for Leah. And he could have taken Leah on his arm. And he could have showed up to church in San Jose on a Sunday morning. And took Leah around and introduced her as Rachel. And he could have said, I want you to meet Rachel. The dream, the beautiful because apparently they looked a whole lot alike. So much alike that Jacob was fooled himself. And the best that we can tell, the only difference between the two, they were probably twins, the only difference between the two was there was something in their eyes. And when you looked into the eyes, you realized the difference between Leah and Rachel. you Jake could, could, could come to church today. <laughs> hey, Brother Shoemake, life is good. Could have had his suit and tie on and his hair combed. And could have smiled at everybody and put on the facade that everything's good, everything's great. After all, if he could be fooled by Leah, then how easy it would be to fool everybody else by Leah. I want to tell you, I can look in this room today, and I can look into your eyes, and I can tell that there's some people that are living with Leah today. But God sent a preacher here to tell you that Rachel is still available, and you don't have to live with Leah. <clears throat> Amen. It's possible to live with Leah and not even realize you're living with Leah. It's possible to be embracing the ugly and the mundane and not even realize that that's 
what you're embracing. Amen. Is somebody here? Is, 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 are you with me here today? Amen. I'm telling you, there's a possibility that you are embracing Leah today and you don't even know it. There's a possibility that you're holding Leah in your arms this morning and you think it's Rachel. Amen. But you, you know what's going to happen in this service this morning is the sun is going to rise. Amen. And it, it's going to reveal to somebody that I, I've been living with Leah. Amen. God help us. Amen. I, 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 I don't, I don't want to show up to church with Leah on my arm and try to convince myself and try to convince others uh, that it's really Rachel. Because you, you know what? It's, it, you're the one that's living your life. Uh, Brother Shoemake's not the one having to live your life. Uh, amen. The, you, your children, your family's not having to live your life. You're the one that's having to live your life. Uh, you know who it is that's got to go home tonight uh, with Leah. You're the one that's got to go home with her. Amen. Who cares uh, what anybody else thinks about you uh, if you know in your heart uh, that you are settling uh, for something that is beneath uh, what God has destined for you. Uh, I hope somebody's hearing me today. Uh, I have come to preach uh, a word from the Lord uh, for this church today uh, and for you as an individual uh, and tell you today uh, amen that there is a Leah prayer and then there's a Rachel prayer there is a Leah worship uh, and there's a Rachel worship uh, there is a Leah destiny uh, and there is a Rachel destiny uh, and I don't know about you uh, but I am not content uh, with coming to church uh, and going through the motions uh, and putting on a facade uh, when I can have the real thing. I'm going to tell somebody uh, there's a real prayer life. There's a real walk with God. You don't got to fake it. You don't got to put a smile to hide it. I'm telling you, you can walk with God. You can have your dream. Don't settle for going through the motions. Church is more than about coming and clapping your hands and lifting your hands when it's right. Church is about being an overcomer and making it to heaven. Don't play church. Don't have Leah church. Have Rachel. Man, let's lift our hands today. Amen. Let's pray that God would help us. Oh, God, reveal it to us today, God, every heart, every life. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Today, Lord. But today, Jesus. I didn't come to impress you today. I came for God to move in this house. Amen. If it's all right, we're going to take our time today. And we're going to let God see, amen, do what he wants to do in this house. Uh, hallelujah. Let's just pray for, for another moment here. Amen. God, help us today. Oh God, oh God, oh God. I mean, I, I'm going to tell you what was worse than growing up poor is I grew up in a dead church. Amen. Oh, God, help me. Amen. I tell you, it, it, it's not so bad being poor. A lot of people are being poor. That's not the worst thing that can happen. The worst thing that can happen is when you show up to church and God isn't there. That you show up to church and God doesn't move. I don't know about you, but if somebody runs the aisles and speaks in tongues, that shouldn't be dinner conversation conversation for two months after. It ought to be the norm. It ought to be something that happens where we show up to church and there's a move of God. There are lives hanging in the balance every single service and I don't want to settle. I want to be a prayer. I want to be hooked up. I don't want to skip one prayer meeting. I don't want to skip one opportunity. We need God.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Devil, you're a liar. 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 Satan, you're defeated. I'm glad I got 50% of you on board this morning. But what about the rest of you today? Is there something inside of you that says, I want the real thing? God, oh God, oh. Jesus, help me, God. Woo! Ah, uh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. It takes six people to carry a dead man. Hallelujah. Uh, you know what's going to happen today? Uh, we are going to put our foot uh, on the head uh, of the spirit uh, that has been trying uh, to drag this church uh, and hold it back. Uh, amen. There are good people in this house uh, that have been hindered uh, because of dead people uh, that refuse to move uh, and refuse to do any of the work. Uh, you're laying there like a limp rag uh, and you're not doing anything. Uh, you got negativity. You got criticism, but we're going to put that under our feet today. This church is going forward with you or without you. This church is going for Rachel. We're going to be what God called us to be. You're not going to hold anybody back. You're not going to hold this man back. You're not going to hold his vision back. We're going forward. God's got a plan. God's got a destiny, and we will see it. I said we will see it. It will be done. It will be a compass. You need to get on board. You need to get your mind made up. We're going for Rachel. You don't even have a clue what life is about. You don't even have a clue what you're a part of today. I wish you would get a revelation. This is the kingdom of God. It's not of the world. We're not working on man's kingdom. We're building God's. I tell you, Leah's never going to go away. Leah's never going to go away. Leah's always going to be with you. Leah's always going to be with the church. There's always going to be a Leah. Amen. Even when Jacob had Rachel, he still had Leah. The Bible says, with great wrestlings, Rachel said, have I wrestled with my sister? Amen. And I have prevailed. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, with great wrestling. You know what's going on this morning? There is a great wrestling match going on in this church. Uh, and it's between Leah and uh, on one side. Uh, and Rachel is here uh, on another side. Uh, and there's a struggle going on. Uh, and one is saying, uh, amen, have the dream. Uh, and the other one is saying, uh, just sit down uh, and accept the average. Uh, and on this side, uh, you've got another voice uh, that's saying, no, go on. Uh, 
be what God called you to be. Go forward. Don't live in despair. Don't live in depression. But do everything that God's called you to do. And there's another side that's saying it's too much work. It's too much effort. You ought to just stop at the seven year mark and don't go another seven years. But I come to prophesy to this church that Rachel has prevailed. I know it's a wrestling match, but Rachel's going to win and Rachel's going to prevail and the dream will come to pass. Amen. Listen, listen to me today. Listen to me. Leah. Leah hates the dream. Leah hates the beautiful. And Leah had sons. And Leah's sons, they hate, hate Rachel's son. Leah's sons hate it when they see a Somebody voice the dream that God has given them. Mm. And then the spirit of Leah rises up and says, and says what, what, we got to kill the dreamer. You know what God wants to do or the devil wants to do in this house? He wants to kill the dreamer. He wants to kill the visionary. And Leah's sons, they took Joseph, Rachel's son, and they ripped his coat off of him, threw him in a pit, sold him to slavery. Because they didn't want the dream living in the father's house. And then Leah's sons, they took his coat. They stripped him of his coat. And they brought the coat home to dad. And it was torn, and, it, and they dipped it in blood. And they showed it to him. And they said, what, what meaneth this? I think it's notable that they never even told Jacob that a beast had devoured Joseph. He, they let their father decide for himself what had happened. And Jacob, he sat down on his chair and he said, some beast has devoured my son. If you don't hear anything else I say this morning, I want you to hear this. Leah's sons know exactly how to paint a picture that is 100% convincing that the dream is gone forever. Leah knows how to show up and give you evidence and tell you it's over. And the man who didn't settle for being born in second place and the man who didn't settle for his name the man who didn't settle for reduced wages, and the man who didn't settle for Leah. He sat down. And he settled for a lost dream that wasn't even really lost. For 20 years, <clears throat> he sat there mourning the loss of his dream. The Bible says Jacob refused to be comforted because Joseph, my son, is dead. 
They couldn't even comfort him. The preacher would show up and try to comfort him. And he would just sit there. And he would refuse to be comforted. Because, Brother Adams, you don't know what I saw. You don't know what I've gone through. You don't know the obstacles I'm dealing with. I, I beg to differ today. I do know. I mean, you're dealing with Leah. And Leah's come to you and is doing everything she can to tell you that you cannot be what God's called you to be. And that this church will never be what God has intended for it to be. And devil, you're a liar. <clears throat> Leah, man, we're, we're, we're not going to believe your report today. Oh, Jesus, help me today. I know I'm talking right now. But I'm just as anointed right now as I've ever been in this whole message. And I'm telling you, the devil's a liar. <laughs> Leah's sons are deceptive and they're deceitful. And I've got good news for you here today. You don't have to believe it. If something would get a hold of you and you would get an understanding, you don't have to believe it. If he can get you to believe it, then the battle has been won. <laughs> but if there's somebody in this house today that says, I will not believe what the devil has told me. I, I, and let, let, me let me make it clear. Let me, let me, let me, uh, let, let me uh, expose the enemy today. Because a lot of you have been thinking that it's just in your mind. You just think it's your human intellect and your reasoning because, I mean, my God, you got the evidence and you just think this is you that came up with that conclusion. But I'm going to tell you, really, it wasn't you that came up with that conclusion. It was Leah's sons uh, that came and did it just right and, and steered you into coming up with that conclusion. And he's just got you thinking, uh, if you ever get the revelation uh, that the truth of the matter is, uh, that's the devil that has lied to you and causing you to sit down in your living room and hang your head in despair when you ever get the revelation that that is nothing but the enemy trying to stamp out your future and trying to squash your destiny amen it's a wonderful thing because then you'll realize that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world if it's me I may not be able to overcome it but if if it's the devil, we can overcome it. I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost is in this house. The Holy Ghost is in your soul. And you don't got to believe a lie. Amen. Amen. So Leah's sons took away Rachel's sons. And then about 20 years later, and... Genesis 45, after they had gone and visited Joseph in Egypt, they came back and they told him all the words of Joseph which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. And Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. Hallelujah. The Bible says that it's the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. And Israel said, I want you to know that Jacob's name had already been changed to Israel. But the writer here thought it was important to say that the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. And Israel said, it is enough. Right there in that verse, they used the old name 
Jacob when they said that the spirit of Jacob revived. I want you to know that was the spirit of the fighter. That was the spirit of the struggler and the hill grabber. It was the spirit of the young man that said, I will not settle for second place. I will not settle for reduced wages. I will not settle for a bad name. I will not settle for Leah. And that same spirit revived. And Israel stood up and he said, it is enough. I'm going to see him before I die. I come to preach in the spirit this morning. Jacob, revive. Jacob, revive. The spirit of Jacob needs to rise up in somebody. That old spirit of a young man that said, I can do it. I can be what God called me to be. And somebody needs to make up your mind before I die. I'm going to see what God has shown me. Second time, the second time I ever saw my father cry it was many years later. And I'd already moved to Little Rock. And this was right before I started pastoring. And it was on a Sunday morning service. Service was over and my parents just happened to be there that day. And service was over. And I was sitting on the platform right here like this. And I was talking to a friend of mine. And we were talking for a long time. And everybody almost had completely left. Everybody left the building. And I I looked up. And where the platform is, there's still some pews that are kind of. Um, I'm kind of still behind the pews and to the side, a little bit behind the, the pews. And I happened to look up, and there was about four people in the sanctuary. And my father was one of them. And he was sitting four rows back. And his head was bowed, and his shoulders were slumped. And I could see kind of to the side, a little behind him. And I, I could see that his face was red. And I, I saw his face was wet with tears. And forgive me, the snot hanging out of his nose. And his shoulders were heaving. And I immediately connected it to the only other time I ever saw him cry. And I immediately knew what he was crying about. He was crying about a dream that had never been fulfilled. And here he was, older, and he couldn't go back and do it again. I didn't, even, I didn't even finish the conversation. I got up and left right in the middle of the conversation. And I began to walk toward the back of the church. I didn't want anybody to see me. Because already tears were streaming down my face. I, I remember hitting pews. Trying to find my way. To those pews, I could barely even see. I went all the way to the back of the sanctuary. I went up into the mezzanine and I climbed up into the balcony. And I got the farthest, darkest corner I could find. And I climbed underneath a pew on that Sunday afternoon. And I let it out and I said, God, what do you do about a man? Who has given up on his dream. There was something in me. I wanted to do something about it. I didn't know what to do. And I, I sobbed. 
And I sobbed and I sobbed. In all of my life, I've never cried harder than that. I laid there for two hours. I didn't, I didn't even realize it, but somewhere in that time, my wife had found where I was and just was quietly sitting on, a, on the stairs and waiting for me to be finished. I was praying. And while I was praying, I saw two men, two elderly men. And one, one was, uh, he was strong. And he was helping people along. And the other man, he was weak. And people were helping him along. And I, I saw it so vividly. I didn't know what it meant. And then later that week on a Thursday ev- evening in my normal prayer time. I, I was praying and all of a sudden, I wouldn't even think about it, And all of a sudden God spoke to me. And he said, those two men are you. And the decisions that you make from this day forward determines which one you become. A strong man helping others or a weak man that's happened to be helped. You decide. I got it from that prayer meeting. And I said, God, if you will help me, then I'm going to be the man that you called me to be. God, if you'll help me, I'll make the decisions that I've got to make. And, and I can't do anything about what anybody else has done. I can't go back and meet, remake other people's decisions. But I can make my decisions. And I'm deciding from this day forward. I'm going to be a prayer person. I'm going to be a worshiping person. I'm going to be a giving person. I'm not going to let the enemy have his way in my life. And I come to preach to somebody here today. You are on your way to two people and the person you become has everything has everything to do with what are you going to do from this day forward. You can change yesterday but you can make a decision and you can be the man or the woman of your dreams. San Jose this church is heading to two churches. What are you going to be. One day you're going to realize it was your decisions that brought you to your destiny. Glory to God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What are you going to decide? If you're a young man in this house, you want to thank God right now that you are hearing this message as a young man. And thank God, amen, I'm not hearing it when I can't go back and redo it. Amen, you still got your life ahead of you. You still got opportunity. You can be what God wants you to be. You decide. You decide. You decide. I said you decide. What are you going to be? Where, where, where did Jacob get his, his spirit and his attitude? I had thinking about Isaac. And Isaac walked through the valley where his father had dwelled. And where his father had, had dug wells. And he got to looking around. And he saw that the enemy had stopped up the wells that his father had dug. And, and Isaac, he could have kept on walking. Isaac, he didn't have to stay there. Isaac didn't have, oh my God, help me, Jesus. Isaac didn't have to be doing what he was doing. Oh, but there was a a spirit inside of him that said, I can't settle for this. I can't let it stay this way. Amen. I got to do something about it. And I'm here to tell you, God.
God, I'm here to tell you that Isaac picked up a shovel and he said, I'm about to go to work and I'm going to start digging again the wells that my father did. And let me tell you what Isaac did. He just started digging one shovel and he threw it over his back and he digged another shovel and he threw it over his back and there is something inside of him. If he digs a thousand scoops, if he digs ten thousand scoops, I'm going to dig until I strike the water. There is something in Isaac that knew something about wells. If it ever had water before, it'll have water again. If there was ever revival flowing before, it'll flow again. And he knew it may be a long time, but it's down there. I come to preach to you today that the water's still flowing. The water's still flowing. The water's still down there. If prayer worked for your grandpa, it'll work for you too. If giving giving worked for those before you, I'm telling you it'll work for you too. If you're willing to get out your shovel today and start digging. And tomorrow when you get up, dig another shovel full. And Tuesday when you get up, dig another shovel full. If it ever flowed in your marriage before, it'll flow again. If it ever flowed in your finances before, it'll flow again. I wish I had somebody else with me today. I wish I had somebody else that can agree with me and say it's down there. It's down there. It's flowing. You know what somebody needs to do? You need to get the shovel in your hand and you need to start digging. If it takes seven years, I'm going to dig. I'm going to be what God called me to be. Stand together with me today. Hallelujah. Musicians, come. Amen. Who is in this house? You need to get a shovel in your hand. Come on, San Jose, get a shovel in your hand. Come on, San Jose, get a shovel in your hand and start digging. Amen. How ironic. Brother, Brother Harris told me that the shovel I'm using today was a shovel from some kind of a uh, some kind of an offering thing that y'all did before. Amen. How ironic. Uh, amen. I come to preach to the church today. Uh, San Jose, pick up the shovel uh, of giving uh, and start digging. Uh, the water's flowing. Uh, is there anybody else uh, you want to come to this front uh, and you want to be what God called you to be? Uh, who else today uh, wants to come get a shovel in your hand? Roll up your sleeves uh, and get to work. Who else is back there? You want to be what God called you to be. You're not selling for Leah. You're going for Rachel. Rachel is available. Come on. Lift up your hands. Lift up your voices. Come on. Don't pray a Leah prayer today. Pray a Rachel prayer. Come on, don't pray a mediocre prayer. Don't pray a half-hearted prayer. But pray a prayer that says, I will go and see the dream before I die. Yeah. Pray what this man is praying. Give me the spirit of Jacob, God. Give me the spirit of Jacob, God. What are you going to be, First Church? What are you going to be, First Church? What are you going to be?
Make the decision while you can. Do it while you've got the ability to do it. If you're an old man today, I pray that the spirit of Jacob would be on you. That says the young man, the fighter, is going to rise again. Every stronghold shall 